that other people in this in this audience have, have been doing, right? And I can have uh, some time. So I, I just wanted to find that I just to uh, put in context some of these findings, right? I'm, I'm arguing for a different channel, but I also uh, have observed in the data. So I tried to replicate for us in the finance famous paper on, in 2008. And it's also, uh, it seems to be the case that they were looking, so they are only looking at the 2004 elections, which were a very specific uh, election when the, the mayors who have been reelected for the first time they were allowed to be reelected, they had already been reelected. And their effects only holds for the municipalities that have uh, local radio stations, right? Which is something that arguably it's it's not exogenous, right? And there's like Taylor has done some great work showing that you know these things are are really you know a tool that the politicians can use. So it doesn't seem, so I'm arguing for a, for a different story, right? That is not, the activity, unfortunately, is not being done by the voters, but it's more, seems to be more than on the level of like the judiciary and this interaction with the media. So it seems to be, you know, uh, so in some sense, it's bad news, but it's also good news that at least, you know, they are removing these politicians and they also, the other politicians around them are observing. So because it's not, you know, from the, democratic accountability perspective, it wouldn't be great that we had to know to remove everybody and people not to change their behavior by observing this. And it's something that this um, demonstration effect is also is something that is commonly um, advanced in many anti-corruption initiatives, but there isn't um, a great amount of like evidence that whether it works. So my, my paper is one, I think it's, it's uh, an example of something that shows that this demonstration effect uh, in anti-corruption campaign seems to be, you know, playing an important role. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation and for being out here in the panel of the brave, the, the very, the very last one. This is a, a, a new project uh, joined, uh, uh, done in conjunction with Andrea Posas. It's a large project, some parts we are doing together, some parts uh, I am doing uh, my, uh, alone. Uh, it is it is a project of informal institutions and essentially a large puzzle of what makes institutions work. As uh, 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 Justice Barroso was saying yesterday, in Latin America, we have had in some countries a decade, in, in others two decades, in others three decades of uh, democratic functioning. Uh, uh, but the the performance of different uh, institutions uh, across countries varies dramatically. So now. Uh, we are past the, the point where we pointed to the institutional design as the cause of variation in institutional performance. And one of the questions is how, why is, uh, there are some institutions that are similarly designed in, in, in the countries, but are apparently are only working in some of the countries. So the question uh, is, is why? Uh, I am focusing on judicial institutions uh, and in this particular uh, presentation. I am I am looking at Brazil and Mexico more in Mexico than, than in Brazil. Where's my look? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so those uh, those are two uh, famous union leaders in Mexico. The one in jail right now uh, is uh, El Vester Gordillo, is the former leader of the largest union I think in Latin America, the Pitchers Union in Mexico. Uh, and the other one is the leader of the Pemex uh, Union, of the Petroleos, uh, the, the oil, the Mexican oil um, uh, enterprise. Uh, both of them are equally corrupt. Only one of them is in jail. Now, so in Mexico, we still have a lot of, for my friends, everything, for my enemies, the law. Uh, whereas Brazil, as we've been talking during uh, these two, these couple of days, some things are changing. You know, 
Uh, I don't know who is this policeman because he seems very boring. He was arrested also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the, the, the point is entrepreneurs, politicians from different parties, as well. so things, something is happening in Brazil that is not happening. In, in other countries. Why? Why are these accountability institutions working better in some countries than in others? Not perfect, as some, some of the presenters have said, there are a lot of challenges for Brazil. But in comparison, uh, especially with Mexico, it's, it's amazing what, they, what, 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 what uh, the Brazilians are doing. Uh, so this particular project it, it tries to look at the relationship between informal and formal institutions to try to explain the, the, the performance of formal institutions. No? The for, in, a, in a way, it's kind of taking a dive uh, to look uh, and see what is underneath the formal institutions, the tip of the iceberg, no? the institutional design that makes institutions uh, work or not. Uh, and Mexico is a very nice case in the particular institution <coughs> that I am studying because there is a formal institution that is present in the Constitution of 1917, 100 years ago, uh, that, it, that says the following, Article 97. Supreme Court judges appoint, promote, and sanction district and circuit court judges. So before, just to put it in context, before 1917, the Minister of Justice that was, of course, within the executive branch, used to select uh, judges, like federal judges. In, in the revolution, this is the, this is the constitution enacted during the, the, during the revolution, in order to give independence to judges, uh, the constitution placed this function on the Supreme Court, independence from the executive, right? But it was never regulated. It stayed like that. No regulations whatsoever as to how exactly Supreme Court judges should fulfill this function until 1994, when a judicial council was created. But, but for, since 1917 to 1994, it was up to Supreme Court judges to decide exactly how to do this. So within time, what I do is I look at the, uh, in the archives of the Supreme Court, I look at the minutes where they decide administrative stuff in which they place the, 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 the select the appointments. So I re, I've been reading them. I, I'm still, this is a, it's an important project. Uh, and I, at the beginning, the Supreme Court judges just were discussing meritocratic considerations as to whether they, uh, I don't know, make a list of qualified persons in order to fill a vacancy, uh, who should make the list, uh, one chamber of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court and Bank, Pro probably the judges from the circuit where the vacancy is, is to be filled. So there is a lot of, of discussions about this. After some time, especially around the 1930s, an idea probably out of efficiency emerges that is, let's just take turns. No? Let's take turns. Whenever there is a vacancy, let's, so whoever is, uh, let's, uh, it's, it's your turn, uh, you feel it, you appoint someone, we will all vote in favor of that on the condition that whenever it's my turn, everybody votes in favor of my choice, uh, uh, etc. They, of course, call this the gentleman's pact. No, it's like uh, the gentleman's pact. Uh, now, over time, imagine this was in the, this emerges in the 30s until 1994. It worked like that way. So this created patronage networks within the judiciary, essentially because lower court judges owed their positions and their advancement in the judicial hierarchy to, the, to their boss, mentor, however you want to call it, in the Supreme Court. Uh, as I said, the Judicial Council was created in 1994 to stop patronage because it sort of degraded uh, during the 70s and 80s and created a lot of corruption. So, in Mexico, as in, as in the US, Supreme Court judges are uh, selected by the executive and the, and the Senate. Uh, each one of the Supreme Court judges taking turns elected one of their members, or the, their probably like a colleague from the college, uh, probably his student, his clerk, uh, to, a, to a lower court position, 
and then they also promoted uh, his members uh, of the of the uh, in the hierarchy, <coughs> and they they over time after many terms had passed, they had their what they what the lawyers call uh, not uh, euphemistically this time the corral. Right? Like, oh, uh, what about this judge? Oh no, that judge is from the farm yard, farm farm yard of this justice. No? So every, every, it's sort of a common knowledge. And I argue this is an inform. Not everything is an informal institution. Right? It has to meet some conditions. But this does. I mean, it is common knowledge. Judges behave. Justices behave according to that. Judges behave according to that. And there is sanctions whenever uh, do not. Whenever someone does not behave in accordance to this informal institution, informal sanctions are centralized, but there is. So this worked for a, a long time in Mexico. And as I said, it, uh, these are clearly uh, like a classic example of patronage. You know, it's dyadic relation contingent. You know, it's loyalty on the. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you get a job in exchange for loyalty. It's hierarchy and it's it iterative because the Supreme Court judge. Uh, oversees the career of the lower court judge. Now, I am, as I said, I am collecting this data, but to give you a sense, this is the percentage of appointments that I found in the minutes of the Supreme Court in which the name of the Supreme Court judge and the name of his appointee is, is mentioned. Because at the, at, the, at the beginning, from the 20s of, until 1950-something, there, there was a lot of discussions, and not in every appointment, there was this personal connection between the appointee and the appointment. But by the 1960s onward, essentially all appointments, the, the turns, uh, 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 each, each appointment, I can identify one Supreme Court judge to, to one uh, lower court appointee. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that uh, up until 1970, Six, I put here, around the 70s, the federal judiciary was very small. It was very small. We are talking about a couple of hundred people with, like, the, uh, for the whole federal judiciary. But starting in the 70s, the federal judiciary started to increase. So the number of vacancies started to increase. The number of turns started starting to be more and more. I mean, the, the rounds started to be more frequent. So at the beginning, there was a kind of benevolent patronage because justices used to appoint their students, their clerks. There was a, like a mentorship relationship. But in this period, in this period, they appoint their brother, their friend, their neighbor. I don't know. I mean, a lot of unqualified persons entered the federal judiciary during this period. And of course, a lot of corruption scandals start emerging also during this period. No? So in the 70s, I am also tracking down news regarding scandals of corruption of judges. And during the last period in the 70s and 90s, there are a lot of scandals. And there is a lot of inefficiency or perceived inefficiency of the judiciary. And then you have the reform of 1994, creating a judicial council, uh, uh, making uh, merit examinations uh, obligatory to uh, enter the judiciary. No, so just to stop patronage. Now the question is, has it worked or not? So now you have a new formal institution to combat this patronage informal institution. Uh, <laughs> but of course, the patronage networks do not disappear. And uh, since the Supreme Court uh, was uh, the, the powers to administer the, 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 the economic and uh, human resources of the judiciary was were taken away from the Supreme Court and given to the Judicial Council. There has been a war between the Council and the, and the Court since 1995, and the Council lost. The Supreme Court arranged to change the rules of selecting the, the councillors, and now the Supreme Court exerts a lot of influence on the, on the Council. And that has been undermining the performance of the Judicial Council. I think that is due to these patronage networks, but that is to be proven. One of the things that I will be able to do after I collect all the data is to see if this, that is nepotism in the judiciary right now in Mexico, uh, uh, is connected to the patronage networks. So this is, each one of these is, uh, is a, it's a circuit. Mexico has 32 circuits. The red points is uh, 
the number of the red point is the number of judges or magistrates that have at least one family member working in the same circuit. And the, the blue one is the number of a, all judicial officials in that circuit with at least one family member working in the, in, the, in the same circuit. So we see that regarding judges and magistrates, there are some circuits in, in which almost 80% of the uh, of judges or magistrates have at least one member. And one of them in, in, in Durango, that is over here, has 18 family members working in the same circuit. No? So one of the, one of the, uh, one of the uh, hypotheses of the project is that <laughs> informal institutions like patronage that developed and formed in Mexico impact on the performance of formal institutions that as the Judicial Council, in this case represented by a cheese, in Mexico, in which the fungus is the informal institutions. It's like it's competing and it's eating up the formal institutions. It looks like a good cheese. Yeah. It may, be, it may taste good. good for Brazilians, not for Mexicans. It is, the, it is performing badly, now the formal institution. And I will rush to, the, to, compare, to, to, to make the, the Brazil comparison. As everybody, as many people said during these two days, in Brazil there is a civil service a professional civil service. What nobody said is that this uh, institution goes back to the 1930s. It was a personal project by Getulio Vargas who took it personally just to create, a, the, a, it was even a ministry. You know? uh, and despite Brazilian instability in the 20th century, this institution persisted, the formal institution, this ministry, sometimes large, sometimes small, it was combated, but it persisted. To the point, I would argue, that it promoted the development of an informal institution, a positive one that we can call professionalism, according to which members of the civil service in Brazil behave, uh, are punished if they deviate, etc. I don't know if this is true. This is a, 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 a hypothesis. Now, in the constitution of 98, as Lucio was mentioning, the constitution is large, is complex, uh, it was a, 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 a difficult constitutional assembly, but if you read the Brazilian constitution, the part that uh, is related to the civil service, it's very neat, it's neatly done, it has a separate chapter, and I, uh, some, uh, I was listening to, to uh, uh, former President Cardoso once in a conference saying, that was due to the, a strong lobby on, on behalf of civil servants who had already developed a corporate identity since the 1930s uh, and who were coordinated in their behavior during the Constituent Assembly. So this is a kind of a proof that this comes from, uh, long, uh, uh, from the past. Now, there has been good development of these accountability institutions but there were criticisms, too much independence, inefficient coordination, some nepotism. Uh, so then there is another formal institution, a judicial council also in Brazil created in 2004, but not to combat a previous, a, 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 a pre-existent bad informal institution, but to steer the, the judiciary you now into a good direction, a better direction, so to, so to speak, so to speak. So in Brazil, we have the case of a positive informal institution uh, that developed a sort of complementary relationship with the formal institution. That could be the, arg the argument of the paper is to be tested, uh, especially in the case of Brazil. I only have this, I've been reading something, but I don't have any, any, any data. Uh, now, it, it, and with this I will finish. In Brazil, as other presenters have said, it is not only the judiciary, it is the prosecutor's office, the federal police, the, 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 the accountant, the account tribunals, and other autonomous institutions that are working well. No? And they are working well in conjunction, in, in conjunction as a system, and that is very difficult to achieve. No? In, in, in jazz, for jazz drummers, they call it a coordinated independence, no? so that you can, you can have one rhythm with one hand, another rhythm with one hand, also with one foot and the other one. But you have to create a harmonious uh, melody. Otherwise, it's just noise. Uh, it's the same. You have to coordinate police, prosecutors, different levels, judges, in order to have a, such a 
large operation as Lava Jato and Salao and this kind. That is impressive. It's impressive. It, it, from Mexican standards, I mean, the, the, the news of a new investigation in Mexico leaked within a couple of hours, and the politician who is involved in the scandal just flew, flees the country right, uh, next week. No? Uh, so that is, I think, uh, in comparative perspective, very impressive. Not that Brazil doesn't have challenges, but if we look to other countries, uh, it is, it is. I hope the ball uh, in the, uh, falls on the right side <laughs> of the court. <laughs> so, so to speak. Thank you. So we saved the optimism for last. <laughs> <laughs> Said, uh, you also have a son here now. Yes. Yeah. That's a kind of family family, yeah. family connection. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 It's never yeah. way. Yeah. So yeah. The yeah. Taylor dynasty. Yeah. Yeah. The Taylor dynasty. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, Lucio, you're not the only one because Carlos put me also in a difficult position because I'm the last guy standing between you and a pleasant evening out there. So <laughs> let's let's go to the job and let's make it as short as possible. Well, uh, I've been working last year in more in micro electropolitics, which means kind of what candidates and parties, they, what they do between elections and during electro, electro campaigns. For, for this meeting, I decided to do, uh, uh, in, in this work, I found surprising coordination uh, role performed by political parties. In other, in other words, the parties are not good at all in uh, doing, dealing with social choice issues, ideology, gathering people, coordinating people, or aggregate interests, as I'm going to argue, they have been done a, a fairly good job in electing their own candidate. I mean, I would say they have, they have been uh, very impressive work on this. But today, my subject is going to be different. I'm going to make a claim for political parties in Brazil. I know I'm going to be probably trying to say it against the wind, but I think this is quite in order for us to, to discuss. My point here is that the current world price of democratic uh, representation through political parties should no, not lead us to underestimate their role in aggregating interests and managing political conflicts. Uh, I think this is conditioned to enable a good democratic rule of law. This was mentioned before, I think my presentation will resonate some other issues here in the morning. Uh, the whole idea is that democracy uh, cannot work only with rule of law. Rule of laws alone cannot make a democracy work. At least we have parliaments and courts as lossy uh, for, for conflict resolution. And in Brazil, if parliaments are not working as lossy, uh, 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 a local of, uh, of uh, conflict resolution, this will probably lead uh, to a judicial warfare. You drag judges, judges into matters which they lack some particular, like specific expertise, no? including electoral politics regulation. So uh, my point here is that the weakness of political party in aggregating interests in Brazil uh, make overload, creates an overload for, for judges, uh, and uh, make it, it, it might be threatening uh, the rule of law in the, in the future. Two examples have to illustrate the limits of judicial activism on Brazilian electoral politics. They, they have to try to. Uh, uh, to make the system work uh, work better. Uh, let's first of all point out that the Article 45 of the Constitution said only that the federal representative should be elected to a proportional <coughs> system. Well, proportional system for me, for every political science all over the world, means representation through political parties. Candidates is not discussing proportional system. Candidates is about discussion with type of proportional system, with type of party list. 
The proportion of symptoms related to party list. Party list may be closed, party list may be open. But the, the, there's no discussion that proportion of symptoms are related to political party. Well, uh, and so they have tried to, 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 uh, to um, uh, improve our political system, uh, drugs in Brazil. But they're not being very successful in this. And I should say that our fellow here was not present in many of these <laughs> decisions, so uh, uh, it's kind of excluded all this. But in 206, the, the Supreme Court vote against electoral thresholds which were approved in 1996, 10 years earlier, uh, uh, because they, kind of, uh, they make a lot of uh, a time lag, a, a, a large time lag to make the things work. In 206, the Supreme Court denied electoral thresholds. So it would be in favor of, of party fragmentation. In 211, the Supreme Court also is to a vote to ease party switching. It was a discussion about if the, the, the share of the TV, the time of the TV time, which in Brazil is, 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 uh, for, is free, is publicly provided actually, uh, and the money for the public fund for parties would be related to the party seats or to, the, to each kind of, for each incumbent. So an incumbent which to each parties would take this share of the money and the time on TV. So this also in, uh, 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 a signal uh, in that direction towards uh, the party fragmentation because a lot of parties came uh, from that from that situation. And now maybe next year, or maybe, I don't know because next year is going to be an election year, but there, there is a, a discussion of, uh, in the Supreme Court about voting for independent candidates. This will be the total demise of political parties in Brazil because now, until now, the only thing that keeps parties together is that because they are, as I, as I said in the, in the, in the beginning, the Brazil law requires every candidate to be a party affiliate. And uh, the, the, this role of parties, of uh, trying to control which, who is going to be in the list, who is going to be elected, who is going to be favoring the list. I mean, the coordination, the electoral coordination, which so I briefly talked uh, talk, uh, earlier, uh, is not kind of, uh, it is not going to be possible. So uh, I hope that the Supreme Court does not vote this or if it refuses uh, uh, this. To a position for independent candidates. What's the effect? It's the only table I'm going to bring here. I'm sorry, I don't have any Maluf photo <laughs> either. So that's the only table I'm going to bring you. Uh, Brazil always, always was champion of own party fragmentation. And this was before in 85. Uh, we kind of believed in a kind of invisible hand of political competition. So in 85, we make a very uh, a loose uh, uh, law for creating parties. So uh, uh, for, 80, for 90, we have a, lot, a number, big number of parties because we believe, okay, election after election, the voters are gonna, are gonna learn and they'll, they'll by, by then they'll themselves se se separate good parties from bad parties. <coughs> so we kind of, we all assume there was a kind of an invisible hand, an electoral market that will separate good parties from, from bad parties. But this kind of a, didn't happen, so we always have very large number of parties. But you can see that the system was kind of adjusting from 90 to 98. The 202 election, the jump in the 202 election was kind of understandable because it was new election, so a lot of new guys, new uh, 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 subjects appear in, the, in, the, in, in, in that election. But then you see very large jumps after that. I mean, the jump from 2006 to, to 2014 was almost four points in, and this is the, oh, sorry, this is the number of parties. I, I, I think everybody is kind of familiar with that. And a way to measure the number of parties in Congress, we, instead of counting parties, it's just kind of a weighted measure of parties. I mean, it's kind of a, a weight, the, the number of parties by the number of seats each party has. So that's the, the, the whole idea. Uh, also, we have a, a big increase. I mean, the Supreme Court decision apparently has a big impact on increasing the party for a, Fragmentation that everybody now is complaining. So, if we vote in 2018 for independent candidates, how many parties? We're well, going to end up uh, five, 513 because that's the number of seats we have there. So, kind of, uh, it's going to be too much. So, uh, it's, it's hard to, and people start to blame all different things coalition presidentialism, they start to blame for uh, many corruption, this kind of thing. But this is kind of a, 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 impossible for a system to work like this. And that 
this is going to uh, uh, keep this uh, uh, judicial uh, overload uh, 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 afloat. Uh, so there are other examples, but in those two cases, the Congress reacted. Uh, first, the, the Supreme Court tried to national, create national parties for Nabo. That's interesting, because they kind of uh, voted for a measure that uh, kind of the uh, national co electoral coalitions for running for president should be observed in, in state electoral coalition as well. Uh, this didn't go uh, very far because Congress almost immediately kind of voted for a different measure. So, kind of to make a, the freedom of electoral coalitions uh, 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 again uh, to, to retrieve the, the freedom of, uh, of electoral coalitions. The, the third example is corporate electoral donations that we talked uh, a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, decision that then corporate money in election, the Congress reacted by creating a public fund. And uh, actually, in my, in my opinion, the results of this measure still remain to be seen because we don't know what's going to happen in 2018. A lot of people are talking about money laundering and this kind of thing. I, I don't know what's going to happen. It, 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 it remains to be seen. The, 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 the end result of this of this measure. Personally, let's say, personally, I'm in favor. I don't think that a corporate should have to play a big role in, in, in election anytime. This does not, it's not uh, 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 belongs to democracy. But I think it could be uh, how the, this impact, the, the impact of this measure is gonna, uh, 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 but the final result of this measure, I'm not sure yet. Uh, well, after all, uh, since the Supreme Court is not doing quite well in trying to reform the system, uh, is there any room for judicial activism to improve electoral politics? Well, first of all, preserve the Constitution. I mean, this is obvious, but sometimes the obvious things should be said. Preserve the Constitution. Is, it, the preserve the Constitution means ensuring that the system is proportional. It means that we should preserve political parties as uh, 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 as, as much as, as we can. So preserve political parties, reduce fragmentation by recognizing that open lease is, a, is, a, is part of proportional system as, as closed lease as well. So seats should, seat should be attributed to political parties, not to candidates. This will restrict the creation of new parties because they will not be able to, parties, to, 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 to switch parties. And by the way, Many of these new parties that were created that improved party for, uh, for fragmentation, the last election, they were, they were created for an above. Very few parties kind of were created observing the rules of uh, uh, for, for party creation that there is in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the electoral field. So if we, if we for, forbid, well, as Carlos said, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if the push for, for forbids party switching, I'm certainly there will be a, 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 a decrease in the number of political parties. Last thing should be to preserve the difference between competition and fragmentation. To, to have democratic competition, you need just two. You can have more, a proportional system, of course. But don't need to, as many parties as possible because you have to improve electoral competition. It's another thing, but many people in Brazil think that many, uh, many parts are a good thing because they improve competition. Uh, uh, I mean, there is a difference between competition and fragmentation. I mean, when you, the, I think there's kind of a, 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 a gray area. It's not easy to separate those things, but we should be careful about uh, the number of parties. So if you want to make the party system work, you should be careful about which, more or less, I'm not trying to fix a number of parties, of course, but more or less, which number of parties are we uh, 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 able to, to, to take? And finally, avoid partisan oligarchy. This may be contradictory to what I'm telling you right now, but we should preserve the low legal demand for party creation. If this leads to large number of parties sometimes. But indeed, uh, as I told you before, few parties were created by those rules. So keep this rule low, because uh, otherwise, if you make, uh, increase the demands for creating new parties, we run the risk of party oligarchies, this kind of thing, because the market will be so close, there will be no option for new parties to, 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 to show up. Uh, in some countries so disorganized, we should strengthen our political organization, particular political parties that device for interest aggregation and conflict resolution. Stronger parties uh, should be able to build reputation, credibility, 
to make long-term promise to voters because now candidates can do it can can, can do that unless very local uh, uh, promise. For instance, reducing the demand for money uh, during election. I mean, and in my research, candidates have two ways. Candidates have two ways to get votes. One of them is just buying votes, buying support. The other is two political parties. Somehow, the party organization help them to get votes. What I'm trying to tell you, if you make a, 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 an effort to improve our political parties, you can improve this other side and reduce the demand for money in campaign. That's why my, my, my the, the reason of my concern is because we cut the supply. I mean, the, 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 the supply of electoral money in Brazil. But it did nothing about the demand. And the demand is very huge. The demand comes from below. Everybody is involved in election because nobody believes in politicians in Brazil. There is a lot of discredit. They believe that elections are the time, just the only time they have to get something from politicians. So there is a demand from below. We, we didn't do anything about this. That's why my concern about the next election, what's going to happen, what's going to be the end result of banning uh, 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 for, uh, for it money. Again, I'm in favor of the measure. I'm just saying that we have to be uh, 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 attentive to that. Even if we consider, if we not uh, revive the golden age of party representation, uh, occurring in other countries, I'm not saying that we should be back to Europe on the second uh, after the Second World War, Europe was the golden age of party representation. I think we'll be able to steal the current tight world fragmentation cacophony in Brazil, because it's hard to, 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 to go on. Enabling an effective rule of law. Uh, that's my, my point here. And since we are in a, in a rule of law meeting, I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> Very quick, I promise. Um, three great presentations. I I have two uh, questions for uh, Manuel. I'm I'm a bit a bit skeptical about uh, to what extent there is really a a sort of jurisdiction. Where is Manuel? Uh, a jurisdiction uh, defined, uh, you know, with uh, defined boundaries. Uh, because I, I think inform, information flows in those cases beyond these jurisdictions. Uh, <coughs> on a regular basis, we see in you know, the main uh, news uh, outlet in Brazil, Jornal Nacional, uh, seen by uh, tens of millions of people, right? Um, that you know, this mayor was arrested here, and this mayor was arrested there. So it's national news. Uh, but I, I, uh, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm not saying that this this uh, actually affects all arrests of mayors, you know. But uh, a significant <coughs> number of um, uh, uh, arrests are covered by national uh, the, the national networks, and they and they sort of. Flow, uh, you know. I, I I'd like to hear more about um, uh, this control by local politicians that own um, the the, uh, the 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 what's the technical word for that? The, the, the distributor of, of the news uh, in, in those uh, in those signal areas. Um, and one interesting thing is not just uh, if uh, uh, it's not just the ownership of, uh, of by politicians, right? Because uh, uh, what really matters is if it, this ownership uh, uh, is, is related to uh, the incumbent that was arrested, right? Because um, uh, if it is owned by a politician, but it's a rival politician, right? You have even more uh, reasons for uh, the, the, that event being publicized. So you have the reverse effect. So I don't know if you're controlling for that. Um, I, I don't know if you're controlling also by, by uh, Rio Grande do Sul, right? The state of Rio Grande, because uh, uh, several people talk about uh, this, the fact that in, in Rio Grande you have a special 
a unit within the judicial, the, the local judiciary, uh, just in charge of um, crimes committed by mayors, right? But uh, I don't have the details, but maybe you, uh, how, how, what's the share of uh, mayoral arrests, you know, in Rio Grande compared to the rest? So is there uh, uh, some, some bias there? Uh, but it's, it's wonderful work. Just uh, uh, a few, a few uh, issues here that might uh, contribute to, uh, to, to sharpen your, your, your argument. Um, the other, the other one is well, it's basically you know this ju jurisdiction thing. To one extent, it's really sort of uh, a control of, of these boundaries of information. Uh, and the other one is the ownership of politicians. And uh, I have some small reports here, but that, uh, I think uh, for Manuel, that's that's the two points that I'd like to raise. Um, Avalino is, is interesting um, because we we in our uh, research uh, with Carlos, we discuss uh, a lot. Uh, how multi-partyism emerged in Brazil. And the issue of rule of law was present all, all along. In the old republic, uh, it was a banner, banner of reformists. It was the only, the introduction of proportional representation, right? For those that are not familiar with Brazil, that, that occurred in 1932. And uh, the main reasons for that was to uh, to undermine a powerful hyper president, typically elected with over 90% of the vote, right? Ertasso uh, <coughs> Pessoa was, was elected with 99.7% of the vote. So, uh, only uh, the Korean uh, dictator, the, the son, uh, had a higher. Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein was less. Was less. It was 98%. <laughs> So the, this powerful <coughs> president, the only way to, to reduce abuse of power was to introduce the representation of minorities, right? Representation of minorities in the target of the 1930s. Uh, so uh, rule of, of law was an objective. We, we need multi parties in order to undermine a powerful president. And that uh, occurred in the 90s, uh, in the 40s, and in the 50s, Afonso Arinos uh, mentioned uh, in, in, uh, that for the first time in history, the state governments, the opposition win, won in, in state governments. And the president had to rely on, on coalition. So it's a very nice. And now you, you sort of uh, introducing this, this link again that it, it had in the field. So I, th I, I think it, I thought it was fascinating. But there is a, a sort of no linear effect, mm -hmm. right, of, of, of multi parties. So if you have just one party, as we used to have uh, before 1930, uh, at both subnational and national level, um, you, you sort of enhance the power of a single uh, political uh, force, uh, president, and so on. And, but it, and then if you have. Uh, Multi-parties, but moderate multi-parties, then you enhance control. But uh, the effect is no linear. When when you have uh, thirteen effective, uh, uh, the, the effect is precisely the opposite. You you weaken the ability, and uh, this relates to a point I, I raised earlier in my presentation, is that over the last thirty years we have been witnessing the demise of of um, uh, parliamentary checks on the executives in Brazil, right? Uh, the parliamentary inquiries of the past, of the 50s and 60s, that knocked down governments, now are a piece of joke, right? It's uh, it, it just a farce. Uh, it, it, as Lucio mentioned uh, here, uh, some inquiry commissions are actually set up uh, to do the opposite, is to to counterattack um, the checking institutions. Um, so I think it's a, a, a wonderful topic. And uh, as to Julio, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Julio's work, and I'm familiar with this. 
Hulud uh, hasn't uh, 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 stressed many aspects that he has in the paper, which is extremely rich. <coughs> and there's a wonderful discussion of, of the, the jury and de facto uh, uh, judicial independence and how informal institutions sustain that. So uh, maybe uh, you could say a, 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 a few things about that, because I think there's a powerful link that's missing from from the, the presentation here, but it's, it's a great uh, uh, paper. It was the only one that I had access a uh, couple of months ago. Uh, so that, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. For the hardcore, um, then uh, we'll follow the same practice. We'll let's collect a couple of questions and then let the panelists uh, respond. Taylor, uh, for Manuel, so could you say a little bit more about you know, what exactly you think the mechanism is, and do you have any um, evidence of it? So I, I, I guess I take it that, that the, the mayors are um, more aware of, of corruption because because of um, uh, coverage in the television and. Do you, know, you have any evidence of that? Is there significant search of information for them? And Mark is the point that you know, there's often suggestion that you know, the, the police would be aware of this or whatever. Um, and then I wonder if there's, you know, could there be any like um, geographical logic to the investigation of corruption or to um, like producing the, the, the evidence that allows for prosecuting corruption such that like once you know, it'd be like if there was like a random investigation in one town, and then like that area has been used up for that round, and so you're not going to come back to it for a while. Like some, you know, other mechanism that might explain um, that have nothing to do with the uh, media markets, but would have something to do with the same geographical area. I just add to that. Um, Sorry, I just add to that. It's uh, you could have an effect going from the media market to the mayors around the mayor, um, and the signal might be that it's dangerous, and so it could either change the behavior to clean up that mayor's practice, or he could find out better ways to hide um, what he or she is doing in order to avoid the same thing. Thank you. I just want to press that I'm a PhD candidate in sociology at Berkeley, and I have to say that everything sociologists think about political scientists. Happy to know it's not true. You all are really nice. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Should we um, thank you? So I'm just wondering, how are you thinking about inefficiency, or how are you measuring inefficiency? And if you do see increases in judicial inefficiency after that in formal circulation of words, just gets out of hand. No, you already had your chance. <laughs> no, just, you know, could you explore a little bit more the timing? Because the boom, um, you know, uh, uh, starts uh, about eight years before the, uh, the transition in 2000. So towards the end of the old system, there was the, the boom starts and it continues. So I was a bit puzzled by the timing, you know? I just complement to this question because I, I had a similar reaction to the graph of the 70s. So it seems to me that, in a way, I mean, one of the questions is, you know, why are you having this growth of posts? Um, because you are devaluing the, the the value of the patronage. I mean, if, 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 if there's only 100 judges, then that's really important and valuable. If you suddenly have 800, uh, in a way, it might look like you have this whole network, but it's a network of 